Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Gershon. Dr. Gershon was formerly the professor and chairman of the anatomy and cell biology faculty at Columbia University, and he is now professor of pathology at the Department of Pathology and Cell Biology. He is the author of The Second Brain, Your Gut Has a Mind of Its Own, a groundbreaking new understanding of nervous disorders of the stomach and the intestine. This book was written in 1998, and since then there has been even more revelations and discoveries. This is critical to solving all kinds of diseases that humans and animals have. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Michael Gershon to It's Rainmaking Time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think the first thing we should probably do, Dr. Gershon, is lay the foundation and a frame of reference for the audience about the second brain or what's called the gut brain. Talk about it. Well, the brain in the gut is uh, actually my name for it. Um, And it comes from um, its peculiar ability unique ability, rather, uh, to control the activity of an organ independently of influence by the brain or spinal cord. So what we're referring to is called technically the enteric nervous system or the intrinsic nervous system of the bowel. And in contrast to every other part of the nervous system other than the brain and spinal cord, uh, the nervous system of the gut operates the bowel, and can even influence neighboring organs such as the gallbladder and pancreas, so it projects away from it. And it's capable of what's called integrative neuronal activity, which means that it can do complex calculations and um, determine behaviors independently of influence uh, from the brain or spinal cord. No other organ can do that. Uh, so it, it's unique in that respect. And because it shares with the brain the ability to manifest uh, independent, as it were, thinking, I use the word advisedly, uh, <laughs> called it the second brain. Let me just say something about brain. Um, people sometimes get confused about that, and I don't want people to. Um, When I talk about brain, I'm talking about the dirty, rotten, uh, disgusting business of digestion. That's what the gut does. Uh, Religion, poetry, philosophy, God help us, politics, uh, it leaves that to the brain in the head. So the brain has, the brain in the head treats the gut as a good CEO might. It delegates responsibility for these mundane matters of digestion, and it doesn't like to get, if I can mix a metaphor, its hands dirty with that sort of thing. Is it true, then, that this is all going on autonomically? Well, if by autonomically you mean without coming to consciousness, that's correct. It's not voluntary. You can't make your gut contract. So it's involuntary to that extent. But it isn't determined just as a reflex. The gut samples what's going on inside the gut, and it responds to that. And there are um, actions that your brain can take that can influence what the gut does. Not the details of how much enzyme to secrete to digest, how fast, uh, you know, what pattern of motility to select. The gut does that. But the brain can tell it to do more or less. It can even tell it to vomit. You say in the book, though, that the gut knows what it's doing. How do you know that? Well, let me tell you, there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> you did say that in the book, which yes, I appreciate. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ecclesiastes was right in that respect. So it was discovered years ago that if you cut all connection between the brain or the spinal cord. So the brain and the spinal cord together constitute the central nervous system. And the spinal cord is a wholly owned vassal of the brain. 
So the brain can control parts of the periphery, which is everything in the body other than the brain or spinal cord, uh, either directly or via the spinal cord. Um, so the central nervous system talks to the periphery. And two English investigators many years ago by the name of Bayless and Starling um, at the turn of the previous uh, two centuries ago, that is, when the 19th went to the 20th in what must have been a really dirty, uh, cold laboratory in, in, in London with the fogs rolling in off the North Sea, um, discovered that if they cut all the nerves going from the brain or spinal cord to the gut and increase pressure in the limb of the gut, the gut still would respond with a coordinated wave of what they call the law of the intestine. That is, oral contraction, anal relaxation. That was propulsive. So the material inside the gut was propelled in the direction of the anus. Uh, and it did this reproducibly, even when cut off from the brain. And 18 years after their publication, a German scientist by the name of Trendelenburg had tuberculosis. So uh, to set it for you, war raged in Europe at the time. Trenches divided the continent from the Swiss border to the English Channel. Huge armies were paralyzed in a deadly embrace. People were getting killed in the trenches. But behind the trenches in Germany, Trendelenburg had tuberculosis. And tuberculosis meant that you didn't go in the army, even the German army. But poor Trendelenburg had to keep busy. So he strung up some guinea pig intestine in a test tube, bubbled it in a physiological solution so that it kept it warm, and he put a little J-shaped tube into, the, into it, and when he blew into the tube, the gut blew back. And it was tremendously profound that the gut could blow back at him because in doing that, it had to sense that Trendelenburg had just blown in and increased pressure in, inside the gut in its lumen, and the gut had to act on it. And in acting on it, it had shown exactly the same activity that Bayless and Starling had seen 18 years earlier uh, in an intact animal. But here, the brain and the gut were in the garbage with the rest of the animal. There was nothing in the test tube but gut. So that showed clearly and conclusively that in an isolated preparation, the gut could manifest coordinated behavior. It depended on the nervous system. If you paralyzed nerves, it went away and uh, was completely alone in doing it. So it depended on what Bayless and Stalin called the intrinsic nervous mechanism of the gut. And they knew, of course, by that time because another pair of German scientists, they found an immense number of nerve cells in the wall of the gut. Knowing that this huge nervous system, over a million nerve cells uh, in the guinea pig small intestine was there, they were able to say, God, there's a lot of nerve cells, and they must be doing it all themselves. And to continue with the history, Another English scientist by the name of Langley, who is very nasty but great, uh, being nice and being bright don't necessarily correlate. Understood. Anyway, <laughs> anyway Understood. what Langley did is Langley defined what we now call the autonomic nervous system, and he defined it as a uh, completely motor system with a peripheral synapse and he divided it into two divisions, a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. And the sympathetic was connected to the central nervous system in the thoracic and lumbar sections of the body, and the um, parasympathetic was connected to the central nervous system in the cranial and the sacral. And we looked at all of the nerve cells in the gut and found there were many, many millions and looked at the numbers of fibers running from the brain and spinal cord to the gut.